right, everyone, looks like it's about time to get started. Hello, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us for this presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Louis Navalier. He's one of Wall Street's renowned growth investment advisors. He's also the founder and chairman of Navalier & Associates, along with the editor of Growth Investor, Breakthrough Stocks, and Accelerated Profits. With that said, Louis, I'll hand the mic on over to you. So if you need anything, I'll be right here. Floor's yours. Wonderful. Well, it's an honor to talk to you folks today. Um, probably the most controversial thing that we're doing is um, when we run our weekly stock selection screens, we just have been adding more and more energy stocks. And so uh, they're 60% of our portfolios right now, and they are going to have the best earnings for the next two quarters. And um, even though earnings have decelerated for the overall market, they've accelerated for us. So we feel pretty good. And um, just so you guys know, the uh, Biden administration has been manipulating oil, oil prices by releasing a million dollars, excuse me, a million barrels a day from the Strategic Petroleum res Reserve. And that's why, for a while, gas prices were falling. They never really fell on the West Coast. That's heavy sour crude. But the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is mostly light sweet crude. So that helped gas prices fall for a few months in the south, the um, the northeast, the Midwest, and Texas. But unfortunately, that has come to an end. Um, the uh, uh, Although they're still releasing from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, uh, they're anticipated to stop in, in November, largely because the reserve has been drawn down to the lowest level since uh, 1980, and they're going to have to start refilling it. Uh, the other thing that's going on, of course, is OPEC has announced a uh, OPEC Plus has announced a two bill, a million a barrel a day cut. It'll probably be more like nine hundred thousand barrels a day um, after all the cheating and quotas and all that stuff. But that's still one point nine million barrels of oil that's going to be off the market. The other thing you should be aware of is um, energy usually uh, declines in the in the fall because of demand drops but it resurges in the spring. We're in the camp that uh, oil is gonna be $120 a barrel in the spring as demand picks up. Europe is still in a, an absolute mess right now. They gotta secure more oil supplies. Obviously they're not too happy with what Russia's doing and the escalation after the Crimea, the Crimea bridge attack um, that Russia, the response Russia had is not going over well at all. So fascinating times we're in. I want to show you some charts and I'll give you my best energy stocks. Okay. So let's look at this global energy picture. Um, this just shows the mix between uh, crude oil, natural gas, coal, uh, renewables, nuclear, and hydro. And um, you can see that uh, uh, crude oil um, uh, as uh, uh has shrunk just a tad. And one of the things that's interesting in America, our demand dropped to buy a million barrels a day when prices went up, although it's starting to come back. Uh, again, on the West Coast, they still got $7 gas in California, so that's not really happening. In fact, I, I have a home in Nevada. I, I filled up there, and it was at Costco was five eighty five dollars a gallon. So well, the West Coast has had no relief. But um, natural gas has become uh, a bigger deal, okay? And coals become much bigger. And renewables have become, are, are doing a little better. Um, but here's the deal. In two years ago, the Energy Information Administration said that fossil fuels were 80% of um, uh, global energy uh, uh, usage. And because China, India, Indonesia, and and, and um, Europe, plus even in the U.S. a little, we're all burning more coal. Uh, it looks like it's going to be up to eighty-four uh, percent. So whatever we're trying to do with the green revolution is happening a little bit slower than it should, even though renewables have gone up. Okay, so um, here's the real problem. These are the price increases in oil. Uh, in 2001 and 2022. So 2001's in, in green, 2022's in red. As you can see, the price of Brent crude oil has risen two years in a row. Natural gas, it's risen, although the real big spike was last year. 
Coal remains hot and heavy. Uh, thermal coal, which is used for steel, is even higher. Cobalt is a big problem um, because cobalt goes in the lithium ion batteries. And I know there was a plant open in Idaho recently, but most of it comes from the Congo. Um, a lot of it's strip mined, but uh, a lot of it also comes from children in the Congo crawling these 100 foot holes to sell uh, cobalt. Uh, the EV revolution uh, cannot continue without cobalt, okay? And uh, and it is be and the the lack of supply of cobalt as well as the higher price is constraining EV production right now. But even bigger is lithium, and uh, you can see the price of lithium has gone absolutely nuts. It's up over four hundred percent, only twelve months. So what in the hell is going on? Well, um, there's two types of batteries. There's iron phosphate, which actually uses more lithium. CATL has pioneered that battery. Uh, Tesla uses iron phosphate batteries in China. Those cars are cheaper. You can do 100% charge. Uh, they don't have the fire risk. Ford just signed, signed a big deal with CATL uh, to make uh, iron phosphate as well as lithium ion batteries in, in America. And then finally, uh, Rivian, you may know, has, has gone to iron phosphate batteries because they can't afford the more expensive lithium ion. But uh, the new lithium ion batteries are more efficient, um, but they're still the fire risk. They're using a lot more nickel lately. A lot of the nickel came from Russia, but now it's come from Canada. But uh, the price of lithium is, is a real problem. Now, our biggest lithium stock, just so you guys know, is SQM. It is down today but its earnings are forecasted to be up 1,140%. That's the Chilean lithium miner. They also mine copper. Uh, they also uh, produce fertilizer. And you might wonder, well, why is it down if its earnings are gonna be up 1,140%? Well, the Biden administration is going after uh, Russia today on aluminum production. So aluminum prices are spiking. Uh, the whole mining sector is being taken out by the aggressive action that Biden has against the um, against Russia. So it took out the whole mining industry. So SQM at this moment is a phenomenal near-term buy. Again, the earnings are forecast to be up 1,140%. Their sales should be up uh, probably almost 300%. So, um, so we got to do fossil fuels because EVs are really expensive. Uh, you already found that out. Ford just increased the price of its F-150 Lightning last week. It's the second price increase, and, pri and prices are up 30%. Teslas have multiple price increases. Um, you know, I have an EV. Um, it died about two and a half months ago. My daughter was home from college and running around in it. and She said, hey, Dad, it doesn't charge anymore. So we uh, drove it to the dealer, and, and uh, he dropped the battery pack. And that was two and a half months ago. They replaced controller boards. They replaced some cells. But reform, it's got more bad cells. So our EV, our EV only has 23,000 miles on it. It's three years old. And it's acting like a bad cell phone. So can you imagine if all the other EVs behave like ours and the batteries have to be replaced? The batteries in our EV come from LG Chem. You may know that LG Chem had to replace all the batteries in the, in the, uh, in the Chevy Volt. Okay. Um, the Mach-E is all LG Chem batteries, Volkswagen Group, which is Audi, Porsche, VW, all LG Chem right now. Um, uh, Volkswagen Group will be diversifying against other battery suppliers, but um, I just find that interesting. Okay, so the world's got to cut Russia off now. And Russia does natural gas, coal, and oil. And, you know, Russia was trying to take over the Donbass region in uh, Ukraine. And just so you know, that's all coal. And it's clear Russia just wanted the resources because they didn't want the people. They, you know, obliterated all the buildings. And um, so the rest of the world doesn't want to buy resources from Russia because of how they obtain them. And, um, but Europe is really struggling. They say they have nat nat natural gas this winter, but that's until a cold front comes. And if it gets colder than normal, Europe's really in trouble. In fact, some of the German factories know their electricity is going to get cut off. Because um, you can either heat homes or you can make stuff. So what an absolute mess, okay? Um, 
and we got to replace all this oil, coal, natural gas that Europe's using. So that's keeping prices very high. You may know that we're exporting natural gas to Europe uh, hot and heavy. Although Europe says they, they have enough for this winter, that's a, that, that is not going to be true if they get an extra cold, cold blast. And furthermore, they have not locked up all their supplies for 2023. So for next year. So we think uh, the prices for energy are going to remain very firm, especially, okay, as we go into next year and demand picks up in the spring. Okay, so uh, it's funny, you know, I was um, on a Baltic Sea cruise, uh, a money show coordinator for uh, Forbes, and um, we would go to countries like Latvia and Estonia, and you'd be shocked how much wood they burn. Okay? That's just kind of their culture there. And they've got plenty of wood to burn. Guess who also is burning wood? Uh, Germany. Now, Germany's very efficient. They like pellets. They have very efficient stoves. Okay. You might have a pellet barbecue, okay? Um, or if you live in the Mountain West, you could have a pellet stove as well. But um, it's getting pretty bad when you have to, to um, uh, burn wood to, to, to keep warm. The other thing that's going on is I remember being in um, Gdansk, Poland, and the amount of coal at the port was unbelievable, just mountains of coal. I'd say the equivalent of four aircraft carriers, uh, mountains. I mean, anyway, and believe it or not, Poland's light on coal. They used to get a lot of it from Russia. But the people in Poland need coal to heat their homes. And, uh, you know, this is what's going on in the world. So uh, fascinating times we're in. So let's look at our picture here in America. Uh, West uh, Texas intermediate crude prices uh, did drop because uh, we were releasing from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, a lot of light, sweet, heavy crude. But the hurricane uh, disrupted the SPR release. And um, so now prices have headed back up. And then, of course, we have the whole Russian chaos and uh, that continues. So... Uh, uh, the other thing that's going on is Bloomberg leaked a report that the Biden administration would start refilling the SPR uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve if oil drops below eighty dollars a barrel. So we have a floor under oil at eighty bucks, and uh, and we're um, so we're we do think uh, oil's uh, going to go a lot higher, one hundred twenty dollars a barrel in the in the spring. The West, well, w, that's Brent crude. Uh, West Texas and me, it might only go to $115 a barrel. But uh, that's going to be great for our energy picks. Uh, here's the drawdown, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, this is through September 30th. It's much worse if I include uh, what's happened the last couple of weeks. But uh, in fact, the Biden administration was trying to increase it to $10 million a week. But then the hurricane uh, got in the way. So fascinating times we're in. But uh, they've been purposely trying to manipulate oil prices with this SPR release, and it's not going to work much longer. And, you know, it also is a big political consequence. You know, they, the most pollsters are saying Nevada is going to switch uh, because of the Senate race in Nevada, and people are just really mad at the gas prices because in Nevada, it's over $5 a gallon. Again, I filled up a Costco in Nevada, in Reno, Nevada. It's five eighty five. dollars So... Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it affects the midterm elections, but we expect a, a change in Congress. All right, so um, here's the S&P 500 energy stock uh, price history. The fascinating thing about the um, how S&P and uh, energy is correlated is, believe it or not, energy fell to only 2% of the S&P 500 because of the big push on ESG. It's now 6%. It's probably going to 20%. So we think energy stocks are still in the early stages of a big, big long-term rally. So let's look at P ratios. One of the things that's interesting about the energy business is when you release record earnings, triple-digit earnings, um, and we're getting it in, in refining and marketing, we're getting in integrated oil and gas, you know, pipelines midstream and you would get it in the integrated energy companies you compress p ratios 
So today in large cap, I'm trading only 7.6 times next year's estimated earnings. Small cap, I'm 3.6 times this year's estimate, next year's estimated earnings. This is ridiculous, folks. Um, these are cyclical stocks, and that's why they have low P ratios. A lot of them have big juicy dividend yields as well. But I'm telling you, the P ratios are too low. So we got two more quarters of triple digit earnings for the energy patch. So I don't know. I don't think P ratios are going to are, are going down. I think the stocks will be surging because Wall Street will be so desperate to lock in on anything with good sales and earnings. Now, if you work for a university, you, you're probably prohibited from buying energy stocks as most uh, because of uh, their fossil fuels. If you're in one of 38 blue states that have passed restrictions, you might be uncomfortable buying them. But the the push against um, fossil fuels is failing. Okay, and uh, you know Europe led the way, and look what it did their economy. Okay, so the operating margins for the uh, S and P 500 energy stocks continue to expand. You know, it's interesting. Um, the Biden administration has given out the fewest drilling permits since uh, the Nixon administration. So we're not trying to drill our way back. Uh, they like to say they, there's thousands of permits. But the Biden administration was very hostile. And um, what happened is, uh, as soon as they got in, not only did they kill Keystone, which would have been 900,000 barrels a day of oil from Canada, um, he also killed uh, drilling on federal lands. And the ConocoPhillips and the EOGs are very responsible companies. They capped the wells. Unfortunately, a lot of independents didn't. So the, a lot of wells in south um, uh, eastern New Mexico were just spewing out natural gas and methane. So when they passed the Inflation Protection Act there, they put in a methane tax. And that's going to bankrupt a lot of the independents that didn't cap their wells properly. Now, if you believe in global warming, you do not want methane pouring in the atmosphere. That's the same thing that happened when Nord Stream 1 got to blown up. So. Um, you know, it's interesting that they would do a federal drilling ban, and but that drilling ban just caused more methane to leak in the air. But um, it's uh, a lot of the people that frack basically uh, said, hey, we're not going to frack more. They're dealing with higher taxes on the royalties to the federal government, as well as this new methane tax. So the big ones are going to have bigger margins for now. And here's the earnings revisions uh, on the energy patch. Despite the fact that crude oil prices are moderating, the earnings revisions still remain very positive, close to 20% up. So we're going to have a blowout, blowout, third and fourth quarter for the energy stocks. And by the way, I've had companies pre-announce, earnings are working. Even today, uh, we had PepsiCo come out better than expected earnings, and it popped. So earnings are definitely going to be working here when they come out. So here's the revenue for the energy stocks. It's still rising. So um, we're, in, we're in good shape here. Here's a forecast for 2022 and 2023. Eventually things will slow down. The year-over-year -year comparisons will get tougher. But even in 2023, two, uh, uh, next year, uh, we're still gonna be growing um, you know, over 4%. So I think that, that, that will go higher. We'll just uh, wait and see. So. This year, we're looking at 11.9% revenue growth for the energy sector, uh, excuse me, for the S&P. And then uh, next year, we're looking at 4%, but the energy stocks are gonna be growing a lot faster. Here's the S&P operating margins for the energy patch. Uh, again, phenomenal. Uh, this is gross operating margins. I mean, these are obscene margins. And uh, you know, the energy stocks like to pay out big dividends, Looks awfully good here, folks. And here's our uh, annual forecast for the energy patch. This year is the big one. Excuse me, last year they went up 50%. Uh, this year they're forecasting 9.2. My average stock's over 100%. So I think this is, um, um, uh, I, I, so let me just back up here. This is the S&P's operating earnings forecast. Uh, this year, their forecast will be up 9.2. Next year, 7.2. Uh, 
uh, our earnings are a lot stronger, okay? Uh, our average stock is going to have over 40% sales growth, uh, and our average energy stock is going to have over 100% earnings growth. Now, for the third and fourth quarters, the strategists were saying the S&P earnings would contract 5.4%. That's because a strong dollar impedes multinationals. However, we just had PepsiCo beat. The other thing is the actual analysts are expecting uh, about 2.4% earnings growth. The analysts are better than the strategists. So the analysts are bottom up, the strategists are top down. So we think we're gonna have a lot of surprises this quarter. Um, but if you're looking for where the growth is a lot stronger than the S&P, you gotta go to the energy patch. So let's look at the current macro landscape. The stock market is obsessed with bond yields. Um, I mentioned today in a podcast, I'm, I'll say it again for you guys. The Bank of England intervened, caused a big short covering rally on Wall Street. They got their, their guilt, their, their bond yields, uh, long-term bond yields down from 5% to 4% because they were intervening. Today, they're 4.9% going back to 5%. Italian bond yields are rising. The Bank of England tried to intervene. They, they intervened twice in a 24-hour period. They told their pension funds if they want to get out of these bonds, they better hurry up and do so because they only got a three-day action planned. And uh, they failed. They failed. Uh, so a lot of the world is wondering if we're going to have coordinated central bank action to control rates. And uh, it doesn't look like it's happening. Our Fed right now is reducing its balance sheet by $95 billion a month. And they're driving treasury yields higher. So the 10-year treasury is probably going to cross about 4% soon. And uh, you can see when yields rise, it hurts the market. But um, again, our energy stocks have big dividends. They're going to be resilient. But right now, as I speak to you, the tail's wagging the dog. Now, we have the producer price index come out today. And what is significant, even though it's running at 8.5% rate, it's only 12 months, the core rate is running at 5.6. And uh, the core rate was running at 7.1 in March. And it was falling every month. But for the last two months, it's leveled off at 5.6. So food prices were up 1.2% uh, last month, uh, energy up 7 tenths on the wholesale level. So inflation is structural. We can take food and energy out, it's structural. So fascinating times we're in, but uh, you can either profit from inflation uh, or you... Uh, or you can choose to, to complain about it, but I think you ought to profit from inflation. There's no better place to go than the energy patch. By the way, CPI comes out tomorrow. The big thing to watch will be that core rate. The core rate actually accelerated in, in, in August. We wanna see if it, if it did that in September. If it does, it's gonna be a bad day. Meantime, the dollar's just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Although Latin America raised rates, we uh, are the, uh, of all the reserve currencies, we're the one that raised rates the, the fastest. Just so you know, uh, China's a reserve currency, but they still have their COVID lockdowns because uh, President Xi is trying to get reelected for an unprecedented third term, th a third five-year term. So he's using COVID as a way to suppress his people. Uh, you may know he dispatched tanks in the streets because people were protesting against, they couldn't withdraw their money from banks. So you don't want to put your money in China. You got a devaluation risk. You can't pull your money out anyway. So you don't want to use them as a reserve currency. Japan rates are zero and uh, they're still doing their quantitative easing. And so you don't want to invest there. And the, the, the Japanese yen is very weak against the dollar. You can go to Britain, which is raising rates, but a lot of economic concerns over there. The poor people in Britain, a lot of them can't pay their utility bills. Uh, there's a lot of relief. Their new prime minister promised and then you go over to Europe and they have the same similar problem. Some of them can't pay the utility bills. So they're trying to come up with some relief. Europe is struggling whether they cap energy prices, which would constrict supply, or they do a special bond offering to pay, pay up for it. Anyway, so if you look around the world, you might as well just put your money in America. We have the strongest currency. We've got higher rates. What makes America great is our 50 states or they're competing with each other. So even if some states get it wrong, you can at least move to another state. So fascinating times. By the way, a strong dollar hurts the multinationals. So we got to watch for that. Microsoft is warned. Let's see if there's other warnings. Here's the inflation spike that you see around the world in the US, Eurozone, Japan. Uh, you know, it's funny, uh, 
the uh, anywhere you have a weak currency, you should have inflation running hotter. Obviously, Japan isn't quite honest with its inflation. But, um, you know, when you have a weak currency like you do with the Japanese yen or the euro, you are going to have faster inflation. In America, uh, the strong dollar is pushing down commodity prices. So we're going to have the fastest inflation relief. But you can see the spike's very severe. And that's why the Fed and other central banks are raising rates. Okay. And this is interesting. Uh, Labor has become a big inflation problem. Um, our workers have become less productive. That's why GDP contracted in the first quarter, 7.5% annual um, productivity increase. Um, they said in the second quarter, our economy contracted because of uh, excess in as an inventory buildup. Uh, third quarter, believe it or not, is forecast to be positive, 2.9. A lot of it's trade deficit improvement. So believe it or not, the Biden administration releasing uh, oil from the street petroleum reserve is helping uh, energy exports. So 2.2%, uh, uh, it was supposed to get 2.2% GDP growth just from improving trade deficit. So right now, the Atlanta Fed's estimating that we're going to grow at two, an annual rate of 2.9% in the third quarter. But 2.2% of that's from releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and other uh, other energy exports. So labor is a bit of a problem, but labor is at least running less than the inflation rate. So workers are hurting more and more. So um, this is a big topic. So we'll see how, the, how this affects everything. Here's the GDP estimate from the Atlanta Fed, 2.9%. Again, 2.2% of that's from an improving trade deficit. A lot of that's from Biden releasing oil from strategic petroleum reserves. So these guys aren't stupid in the White House. They know they're manipulating things. They know they're now manipulating GDP via an improving trade deficit. But um, they're not going to be able to keep that up much longer because the SPR is getting too dry. So let's talk about the yield curve. Uh, a week ago, excuse me, now uh, we're in green. A week ago, we were in blue. A month ago, we were in red. A year ago, we were in yellow. When the yield curve in inverts like this, usually the market turns within three months. So the yield curve did invert back in uh, um, uh, late June, okay? So what's, and then and it all largely inverted because we had a bond rally at that time. But Usually the market turns in three months. So you can argue the best time to buy was, you know, end of September, October 1st. But um, actually October 1st was a weekend. So yeah, the first business day of October. And you already saw a very strong short covering rally first two days of October. But um, some other people would argue that, well, when the yield curve stops in burning, you, you buy it 90 days later. The bottom line, folks, based on the yield curve, uh, I think the market's oversold. I think we should be rallying uh, pretty quickly here, but it's going to be a narrow rally, and it's going to be predominantly focused on energy stocks or anything that has good sales and earnings when the overall market is lackluster. Now, China's a mess. Uh, again, the, uh, President Xi is manipulating um, his provinces with these COVID lockdowns. He's trying to suppress uh protests again the chinese uh can't get their money out of banks and china had to send tanks down the streets to suppress the protesters so uh, uh this is a fascinating time we're in but hopefully china gets more orderly after they pick a president which is um this weekend all right so let's talk about our best stock ideas for this market um before we do the market peaked out on, on August 6th, and as you can see, um, the, this is what happened in the S&P, and uh, the, the single-digit gains were the ones that, um, uh, that held up the best, but everything has been hit in the market. So how do I find these stocks? I find them in my stock grader. This is online free to you folks. Take advantage of it, navalier.com, and here's our best energy stocks for you, ConocoPhillips. Katerra Energy, EOG Resources, Imperial Oil, Murphy, gas, big gasoline retailer, Quanta Services, that's an engineering construction uh, company, 
Suncor Energy in Canada, Tech Resources, a coal company, Targa Resources, more refining, and Valero, more refining. These are our best energy stocks for you, okay? And I am almost out of time here, but I'll take up one question here real quick. And um, here's a question that says, um, my energy stocks are down uh, almost 12% in the last uh, 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 six weeks. Uh, shouldn't I sell? It says, absolutely not. You should wait for the earnings to come out and drop kick and drive your stocks higher. So that's it, everybody. I hope you feel good about my big energy bet. I hope you now buy a lot of energy stocks. Um, if you're a do-gooder and, and do not want to have any fossil fuel companies, you can buy SQM, which is the big lithium miner. Um, uh, it's a good buy today, but as long as you um, realize what's going on in the world, I think you should have a big energy bet. So that's it. It's Louis Navalier. Thank you again. It's been an honor to talk to you folks. I look forward to seeing you at the Money Show in Orlando here shortly. I hope a lot of you can make it. Fantastic, Louis. Thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. So everyone in the audience, thank you once again for joining us. That does conclude our time for this session, but be sure to stay tuned as we do still have a lot more in store for you today. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. <laughs>